they managed to uh, create a chain reaction in the lab in 1938. And at that point, every, every physicist in the world knew that once, you once it was proven that you can have a chain reaction, the difference between that and making a nuclear weapon is just throwing money at the problem. Because unlike politics and science, you throw enough money at a problem, you will solve it. And that's how, uh, you know, uh, America, Germany, the Soviet Union, Japan, they all threw money at this problem. And the winner in this race is obviously the, the state that had the most money, the, UN, the United States. I mean, why, the, in the, a nu nuclear science is not so much, uh, you know, uh, difficult or secret as it is a uh, very uh, very complicated and precise you the mechanism itself is not difficult but the details require uh, uh, let, let's go to a simple example out of uh, mechanical engineering say that you want to have like uh, take a, a wooden panel and with four uh, nails, uh, pin it into a wall, right? At uh, very specific places. But see, when you make the hole, uh, the four holes, it, if you, every time you make the hole, because you pressed on the wooden panel, the wooden panel became slightly bent. So now uh, the, diff the distance between the holes is not 10 inches, it's 10.001 inch. Uh, in case of wood, it will be even 10.05 inches. And once you put f uh, three holes and put nails in, the fourth one will be in a completely different place from where you wanted it. And so you, you need to calculate uh, how every time you make a hole, it will make different. And then you need to uh, check at what order you put in these holes. And you can make a theory, but then you have to make a small test of drilling these holes, and you might come up with an answer that the theory was uh, not full enough and not accurate enough. And obviously, in nuclear weapons, once you detonate it, uh, <laughs> it's really, really expensive. So you can't, uh, you know, blow up a nuke every five minutes to make a test. So you have to make a lot of calculations to make sure that you covered all the possible effects, uh, all the possible you know, side issues, and you you have all the information to make sure that this really does work. So when you say, when you hear something like uh, nuclear secret in, the, I don't know, a TV or a spy thriller, it's not so much that it's, uh, you know, a big secret, as in uh, you have a guarantee that what's written on, that the the formulas that given here are correct. And to get to the point where you know that this formula is correct took thousands of scientists, uh, thousands of hours individually to work to get to the to this little equation that is proven to be true. And that's, again, a question of money because you could have just the same have, uh, you know, five physics professor locked up in a basement for 50 years and they would have reached this same point but you got to it within uh, f uh, I don't know three months by having 1000 physics professors or you uh, got it from a spy within uh, you know half a minute of handing you over the page so let, let me jump in on that real quick money yes now just so people know the information that you're hearing right now from Alexander is, this is no joke. Um, he actually had the opportunity to teach a class in the military on how to make nuclear weapons. During my military service, I, uh, I, I, f I feel that I'm smart and I want to contribute to the best of my abilities to the safety and security of the state of Israel. So, when, so you taught people uh, how to make nuclear weapons. Hey, guys. <laughs> yeah. So when, when someone like me was sent to a training for where they literally spent six hours to explain to people how to correctly fold a sleeping bag for six fucking hours, 
I went to the base commander and, and I, you know, show him papers that, you know, I went to university before I finished high school. I can do better than this. And I met into one, uh, you know, uh, what you call it, master sergeant. And he said, you know what, if you're so smart, right outside my office over there on the bench, I have 20, like, ADHD uh, uh, people who can't sit in a class and uh, I don't know what to do with them because they're too stupid to do anything. How about uh, I put you in a classroom with them and you explain them how to build a nuclear weapon? And I'm like, <laughs> sure, <laughs> just uh, give me a, a blackboard and a, a, what you call it, a sharpie. I'll show them. And uh, to the amazement of the master sergeant and the 20 ADHD sick, uh, sick uh, people, I actually did explain them, you know, the the nuclear football, the Teller Ulam principle, the production chain. This information is not secret, but like I said, the the specific details, this the specific formulas, the accurate details, that's a uh, secret. But the, the general, uh, you know, basic idea of how a nuclear weapon works, that's not secret at all. And Everything I say here is not, uh, you know, hush hush. You can, you, you, you can. Given enough time and money, anybody with a, not not even a master's, a bachelor's degree in any type of engineering, you give him, uh, I don't know, ten million dollars, uh, five thousand workers, ten no, ten billion dollars. 5,000 workers, uh, a facility, uh, all, all the materials that he wants, he will build you a nuclear weapon. It will not be a good nuclear weapon, but it will work on a certain level. So anything I say, the, the, it's not, uh, you know, it's not secret because the details themselves are not, uh, are not what makes. It's like saying that uh, a car uh, runs on uh, rubber tires and uh, 95 octane uh, benzene and it has an electric accumulator to turn on the uh, the frontal lights and uh, you have you need a steering wheel there's nothing you know secret to that uh, so uh, that's what I'm <laughs> saying that I, I thought something in the army that's uh, a very big uh, exaggeration <laughs> Uh, well, I'm glad you clarified that because when you told me the other day, you said, and then I remember you saying something about how you taught a class or something to some of your uh, compadres there on how to make a nuclear weapon is essentially what you told me or so, what I picked up from it. So, yeah, I'm glad that you clarified that. Thank you. So it's not like you were a uh, professor teach. Okay, this little piece here goes here, and then it goes boom. All right. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. <laughs> well. I mean, if I had like uh, right now a sharpie and a blackboard, I would uh, I could uh, draw some things. It's, uh, There's three black helicopters flying over my house right now. Thanks a lot. Uh, I am. I have uh, at least six military bases within ten miles of my house, so I don't really worry about helicopters anymore. Yeah, but these guys are hitting me with LRAD right now. Must uh, not assimilate. Must not talk anymore. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding, man. Let's yeah. let's uh, let's talk about the, the the Planet X if we can, and the uh, different general. Uh, I'll just uh, cut it short into uh, about a five minute. I'll just uh, explain the difference with uh, the evolution of nuclear weapons and the kind of power that they had. Uh, so you had the very first, uh, very basic design of the. Uh, Basically, the first nuclear weapon is that they discovered that if you take a uranium or plutonium and you squeeze it hard enough, it will, uh, it's like uh, if you take, uh, you know, gas in a lighter and you just light it and it makes a little flame. But if you uh, lock it in a closed space, it will, the, when, it, when it burns, it will create a pressure and that pressure will make it burn uh, faster and be burning faster makes more pressure and pressure being more faster and you get uh, you know a gas explosion uh, so it's uh, something uh, a little similar to that we, when you have uranium and plutonium where instead of burning the radiation 
uh, hits them and the atom basically splits into two more uh, stable or unstable atoms and uh, these stable atoms release radiation and that radiation makes another atom split and that's what you have a chain reaction and if you manage to force this chain reaction happens naturally over a very slow rate very very slow but if you can find a way to squeeze this uranium into a tighter space into the uh, not I mean when you when you talk about gas you need to lock it up into something uh, like I don't know of, uh, well you, you know what's a, a gas explosion right you, You've all seen it, but when you're talking about uh, uranium, you need to squeeze it into atoms. And that was the, the big challenge, how to force radiation to move faster, uh, how to make the atoms split. And they worked on this problem. I mean, it was proven that you can make a chain reaction. The only question was how to uh, squeeze it, how to put uh, pressure into it. And then they came up with the solution where they have, like, uh, a high explosive uh, on the inside and low explosive on the outside and they make a very accurate like uh, uh, explosion that squeezes uh, a ball from the size of a basketball to the size of a ping pong ball right of solid uh, uranium metal and just by getting squeezed together it releases enough radiation to uh, make uh, the energy that will be released over a hundred million years to be released in a fraction of a second, in a nanosecond, basically. And that's a nuclear explosion. So they had like one way of just, uh, you know, sh uh, shooting uh, like a bunch of, uh, like, uh, like if you take a newspaper and squeeze it into something that becomes like hard like uh, wood. Uh, and and then you had the, the more complex model of uh, what's called the football, where you have like uh, like uh, like a soccer ball. You've seen it. It's made of uh, uh, hexagrams and uh, pentagram patches, and you detonate them with a very precise uh, nanosecond timing, and they all squeeze this ball into a very small ball, and that explodes. That's uh, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. Uh, and then. Once they once they had this working prototype nuclear weapon, everybody understood basically how that works, and everybody just uh, it was a question of details. So, like I said, anyone with a bachelor's degree in engineering can sit at home and given this information that you know a raging uh, a football of high explosive and low explosive will give you a nuclear detonation. Anybody with a bachelor's degree in engineering can sit at home for several years and do all the calculations to produce a nuclear weapon. It's, it's not secret at all. Then you have a second, uh, a second generation nuclear weapon, what's called a boosted fission, where in, you have not only explosives, but once this, uh, the ball gets squeezed and it starts releasing the radiation, obviously some of the radiation stays in the ball and some goes outside. So to make the explosion, like I said, energy released over 100 million years, you want to release the energy that would be released over 500 million years. And you do that by reflecting some of the radiation that shoots outside back in to make an even faster uh, uh, chain reaction. That's called boosted fission. If the Hiroshima Nagasaki bombs were in the range of several tens of kilotons, uh, boosted fission would go to the hundreds of kilotons uh, up to about a megaton if you make it big enough. And then uh, that's uh, most of the uh, nuclear tests that went on in the late 40s, or late 40s, early 50s. Then uh, uh, the Soviet Union had a bomb, so they had fission, they had boosted fission. Now they had to make something even more powerful, and that's uh, mimicking the, uh, the, what's going on inside the sun, where you have, uh, like I said, this radiation released by the, by the uranium as it decays. 
basically they the reverse situation from splitting an atom is to create two new atoms and that's by several orders of magnitude uh, more energy than you have from uh, splitting the atom you create a, a new atom out of two uh, previously existing atoms but it was very complicated to reach that because if uh, a nuclear weapon you, you, you the 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 blasting cap if you will if for a fission weapon you just need to squeeze it with explosives to get to a situation where you, where uh, atoms can merge you're going to need several millions of degrees and obviously the only thing that can do that is a nuclear weapon and the existing fission bomb but obviously the fission bomb once it starts the radiation will just blow away everything around it so it was a very very big challenge to create something that will uh, in a sense not only reflect the radiation back into a ball but reflect it into a different ball of uh, deuterium and tritium which is a variant of hydrogen what's called the heavy water I mean, they knew that uh, heavy water could be used in some context of a nuclear weapon back in the 30s. The first uh, production of heavy water was in the Soviet Union as far back as the late 20s. I mean, they knew this is valuable. They didn't know exactly how, but they knew that someday there would be serious uses for it. So the, the Germans, the Germans especially, they had this big uh, project in Norway to collect heavy water. And the Germans worked on that. Obviously, they didn't reach the point where they knew what to do with the heavy water. But they, but they still spent uh, enormous amounts of resources to get them because they knew that somehow this would be valuable. And eventually you had, uh, in the Soviet Union, uh, you have uh, Sakharov. Andrei Sakharov, and in America what's called uh, the Teller Ulam, they basically both reached a point where they figured out how to make that. And trying to explain how this works is uh, way above uh, the level of uh, this sort of uh, conversation, but they did figure out a way how to uh, reflect the radiation in a way that would trigger the uh, the heavy water derivative of hydrogen into uh, not a nuclear explosion but to a thermonuclear explosion and that's where you get to the megatons and to the tens of megatons that's where you had the uh, all, all these huge nuclear explosion of 10 megaton, 20 megaton, 30 megaton, 40 megaton, even 50 megaton, that's our bomba. That's the biggest uh, explo uh, nuclear weapon ever tested. Now, this is the point where both sides of the Cold War, basically all sides of the Cold War, because by then you had the, the French and the British catching up. Because, as I said previously, it's only a question of time and money. The more money you have, the, the faster you get to this point. But, you, but if you have less money, much less money, like France and Britain, you will still get to that point. Even a poverty-stricken hellhole like Pakistan did put up enough time and money and did get a nuclear, uh, working nuclear weapon. It's obviously way, way less than uh, what... Uh, uh, the Soviet Union and the US had in their arsenal, but it was a working nuclear weapon. Even uh, even the what the whatever it is that the North Koreans created, it's totally shitty, but on a certain level it does work. It's it's like uh, comparing I don't know uh, a Model T to a uh, Maybach. Can it I jump in a, real quick it, on that it, note? Just for, and I'm not trying to steer the uh, conversation in a different direction, but before I forget, it just amazes me when the media comes out continually and says, oh, well, 
we have to go after Iran because if we don't, they're going to build a nuclear weapon. It's like they don't already oh, have oh. them. I mean, don't you think they've already got no, plenty of, of nuclear of weapons? Of course they have. Uh, the situation in Iran, ah, you'll fall me into a big tangent. Well, uh, I, I don't want to do that. I'm just, we'll, we'll go into that in a minute. It's just me in five minutes. Okay. I'll, I'll just finish explaining the uh, fourth and fifth generation. Yeah, I shouldn't and, have jumped uh, in at that time. I apologize. So basically, once you had this hydrogen bomb, these weapons became so powerful that the next step would be the something on the order of magnitude that testing it would be as powerful as the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs, according to the official version. Yes. So they they didn't have a way to test them, but they did create them. And uh, the PDF that uh, I, I will send you right at the end of this lecture it explains the fourth generation. You probably heard about the neutron bomb and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. It's where they had the, the hydrogen bomb they figure out ways how to make it, uh, I mean, in a nuclear explosion you have like fire and light and all of that stuff, right? But uh, with science, they figure out a way how to make this thing emit a specific uh, types of radiation. Like, uh, for example, if you shoot a lot of neutrons, instead of causing a fire, they would simply give uh, an instantly lethal level of uh, DNA damage to every living creature but leave the town but leave uh, if you I don't know shoot it at uh, blow up a neutron bomb over say New York you would kill every living creature within it down to the bacteria but the buildings themselves would be attacked and the road won't even have cracks in it from the explosion and you have uh, even uh, more uh, complicated and way more secretive stuff where they you know the, the the defenses against nuclear weapons is to just you know dig several miles underground and they created weapons that at a certain frequency they would penetrate all these miles as if they weren't there and just kill the people under miles of uh, hard rock and just kill them all down there without even uh, you know breaching the door so that that's one of the big factors why the the third war the the third world war didn't then a nuclear exchange never happened because it doesn't matter where you hide doesn't matter how deep you go they have a weapon that will reach you that's why none of them uh, dare to push the button because they know that they personally will be uh, reached. Uh, <laughs> and after that, you had the, uh, like I said, with the robotic mosquitoes. I don't need to uh, have seen a weapon that I know it exists. The discovery of uh, what's called antimatter, where. Uh, I mean, you know the famous uh, formula EMC square, right? Oh yeah, energy equals mass times the constant velocity of the speed of light squared. Yeah, it's uh, actually delta E worth delta MC squared, which means if you have uh, a change in mass, this is how much energy you will make. Well, it turns out the formula is reversible. And the like the layman's terms example that I can give is if you have a, a gamma ray, it's basically a form of light. If a gamma ray is powerful enough and you shoot it through a special magnetic field, you can actually split a gamma ray, which is just light, into an electron and an anti-electron. So out of pure energy, you can create mass. And not only can you create mass, you can take this electron that was formed, this anti-electron, the positron, which is antimatter, and you can store it by trapping it into a magnetic field. And the difference between having in storage four uh, of these positrons and four uh, billion, 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 billion of these positrons is again a question of money. So once I hear that they discovered a way to store eight of them, 
they might as well store eight uh, eight by ten to the power of twenty of them, like a gram. But if this gram comes into contact with normal mass, it will again through the EMC square formula. A single gram of this stuff would be just as powerful as all the nuclear weapons of the world combined. That, that's the scale we're talking about. And uh, maybe you heard the rumor about the uh, uh, tennis ball sized nukes. I suspect that this is uh, the type of technology we're talking about. So that's fifth generation nuclear weapons. That's something that's powerful enough to freaking uh, crack open the Earth's crust. That level of power is like instant all life on Earth destroyed type of situation. And uh, let's call them unconfirmable sources. Uh, I mean, the antimatter stuff, that's from the 80s. That's, you know, stuff in the gigaton, where, you know, you can uh, take a, a nuke like that and just... Uh, uh, this is, uh, let, let's call it a, 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 a well-confirmed uh, well rumor that the Soviets made a special n uh, nuclear landmines around the, er, around the coast of the United States. And in case their ever their missile defense system were ever compromised, they make a nuclear explosion that creates a tsunami on all the basically on on the eastern seaboard and the western seaboard and in Mexico that basically kills most of the U.S. population with a giant you know half a mile high tsunami that washes off everything east of the Appalachians and the United States like instantly loses I don't know seventy percent of the population from this explosions alone. So again, the the reason the nuclear war w did not happen and will not happen is because you have no way of even remotely getting to something called a win. And I have the number of five time limit. Uh, anyway, the sixth generation nuclear weapons are even more powerful than uh, an explosion that would wipe up life on Earth. This is something on a level that could uh, take out just crack open a planet, just shoot it at the moon and blow it into pieces. So if there ever was something like a planet X, a rogue planet, a dwarf star that threatens life on Earth, something like a sixth generation nuclear weapon which whose power would be on the order of hundreds of gigatons, maybe even teratons, would be powerful enough to blow this thing into pieces in case it ever threatened us. And I personally suspect that the entire international project of CERN was to create this the type of facility that would create the, just like a nuclear weapon, a fission weapon needs uranium and plutonium, and a thermonuclear weapon needs heavy water. I suspect that CERN was used to create the raw material uh, to create such sixth generation nuclear weapons if they were ever needed. So even if there was a Planet X and even if it was imminent to crash us, uh, there are ways to blow it out of the sky. So stop uh, worrying that Planet X would show up tomorrow and destroy life on Earth. We have weapons powerful enough to stop it. You know, that's a, yeah. very, that's a very interesting point you brought up there, and I'm going to go out here on a limb and discuss something that I feel could be a possible rerun of previous events that happened maybe tens of thousands of years ago, hundreds of thousands of years ago, millions of years ago. I don't know. But it certainly seems to me like this has happened before. We've been here before. We've dealt with this situation before. It's like deja vu moments over and over again sometimes. And what if Star Wars, in a sense, the, the movie Star Wars, where you've got the Death Star... I actually never watched it. I never watched any of them. Wow. Okay, well, let me tell you. <laughs> I, was, I was born the day, bef the day after my mom watched Return of the Jedi. So I was literally in my mom's stomach. She watches Return of the Jedi. The next day I'm born. I'm a huge Star Wars fan, and I'm sure that has something to do with it. But I think that there's a lot of possibilities with that series where there's this... Um, giant 
weapon called a Death Star. And it literally is like a miniature moon or you know satellite, essentially. It's a huge satellite, miniature moon, whatever you want to call it. It's a Death Star. And it blows up planets. It blows up planets. And it has this, it's like a CERN type technology. Yes. It's a CERN type technology. I've wondered if CERN, not only is it looking for the God particle and it's looking for the smallest piece possible, but it can uh, also be that's, used. Uh, well, that's, uh, don't, don't insult the intelligence of anybody who did. Hold, hold on a second. Let me, let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. I'm not insulting yeah. anybody's intelligence. I think that they're using it for that too. I think they're using it for a multitude of things. I think that might be one thing that I definitely feel that's one thing that they're using it for. And I also feel that they could be using it to maybe test some type of black hole weapon technology where they could literally create a black hole where if something is coming towards it, instead of blowing it up, what they do, boom, make it disappear and go to a completely other dimension, uh -huh. completely disappear, no explosion, no debris, nothing. The whole thing is gone. And then they could actually pinpoint it. So they could make a somebody's shoes disappear. They could make one person specifically disappear, or they could make an entire planet disappear. And then relocate it. And then maybe tap into different dimensions and different opportunities and different alternatives and different alternative realities. I think that there's a multitude of things that CERN can be used for. I'm, I'm a conspiracy cool. theorist. I mean, critical thinker. I'm struggling to uh, phrase even a partial answer for that, but let's just say that your understanding of how uh, black holes and CERN uh, in general work is very, uh, very, very uh, not even in the ballpark, but... Dang it. Uh, as I said, uh, if you wanted to create a Death Star style uh, uh, weapon system, like I said, once you have the science of how to create the weapon itself, uh, creating it is only a question of money and getting to any working prototype. And like I said, the difference between uh, uh, the F-15 and the uh, uh, Mustang is just how, F and the P-51 Mustang is just how much money you throw at the problem. So yes, if you had enough of money to throw at the problem, you could build a Death Star in space. And you can build a Death Star s style weapon system on Earth with this thing. Uh, in, in terms of teleporting the planet to another dimension, the Let's just say that the scientific breakthrough is not publicly known to have happened. But I, it cannot be uh, totally excluded. But uh, let, let's just say I have not heard of uh, such a situation. In terms of making an entire planet disappear, you, you go into a... a let's just... <laughs> Let's just say that science itself uh, also has a faction of uh, uh, extremely theoretical, very little evidence type of uh, thinking. And that. You just need a lot of energy to do it. Uh, if you think uh, about the experiments that the Chinese yeah. actually. Well, hold on, hold on a second. <laughs> there was this yeah. article that came out a while ago where the Chinese did this experiment where they actually teleported. Uh, it was like an electron or a, just a very minute particle. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. That, so, that stuff, yes. But like I said, you have a general concept, but you don't have the scientific breakthrough that allows you to teleport something much bigger than an electron. It is theoretically possible to teleport something big, but uh, we do not publicly know that the scientific breakthrough to do that has happened. I mean, people are working on it, but we have no evidence that they have reached a point where they actually have something. Even a theoretical, not even a prototype, but even a theoretical scientific breakthrough that would allow such a thing. Let me give a quick example on that, too. Like, the technologies you're talking about that could blow up planets. That technology, that energy source, that amount of energy would probably be required, if not more, to teleport a planet like that. So, take that energy source find a way to transmute it into a teleportation source, like take the blueprint of what the Chinese did into a larger scale, and then boom, there you go. Bingo. 
when you're talking about something like teleporting, it's a, it's a completely different thing. It's not even a, like I said, we do not know exactly how it would be. It would not be a question of energy that I can tell you. It would be a question of uh, cracking open the space-time fabric itself, and that requires uh, 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 you're going to need a physics professor to even formulate a a non twenty hour lecture answer for that question. But let's just say we do not have an easy. We have not reached the point where there is even an easy answer for how it would be theoretically done. About uh, transporting an, an electron is go from uh, what I said at the very beginning, where you, you cannot uh, um, tell for certain whether an electron is here and is doing this thing, you can promise that it's in orbit. So they just force it to move out of a certain orbit into a way different orbit by uh, what it means, but the difference between moving an electron and moving even a, a single atom, that a scientific breakthrough has not been reached yet. Or as I know, maybe it has been reached in some secret DARPA lab, but the general public doesn't know it happened. So uh, teleportation is still a long way away. But as I said, given enough money, we will reach that point. Certainly. I mean, the possibilities are endless. If you can think it, there is a possibility that that can come into fruition. And that's the first spark is just the imagination of yourself, like others, like professors and those that research this kind of technology, futurists as well, with the right funding, the amount of effort that they put into it, stuff like this can eventually happen. So, yeah, it's fascinating to think about. Let's jump back to reality, I guess, for a minute. Uh, I I would be accused that I'm intentionally avoiding sub, a touchy political subject, but actually I started this whole thing because I wanted to talk about touchy political subjects. So l let none uh, dare accuse me that I am avoiding them intentionally. The only thing I I am avoiding intentionally is my military service, which was uh, traumatic. But in terms of politics or history, I refuse to avoid a topic like Iran. Uh, okay, uh, then again go to the Soviet Union. Uh, basically, the Soviet Union is composed of more or less three main parts. You have, uh, let's call it uh, Russia proper, which is basically more or less Russia that you see today. And all of the southern regions, including parts of uh, what's Russia today, uh, are places like Kazakhstan, uh, Uzbekistan, uh, Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan. When you hear all the stans, that usually means that they are Muslim and they are backwardly, economically, culturally. You have uh, in one of these some crazy dictator who thinks that he's the new Jesus and he wrote uh, like a book of uh, like he thinks that it's the new Quran or something and he like forces the people of his country to pray for it. And in another country, you had a guy who would, uh, you know, he was like a crazy cannibal. You know, like uh, Africa level of uh, crazy dictatorship. That's what uh, the people... Remember I said last time where you had members in the Politburo who wanted to break up uh, so they could have their own little kingdom? Well, that's what happened to these little kingdoms. And the ultimate goal of the United States, of, the, of their, you know, high-level strategy on the, like, you know, Kissinger and Brzezinski level of strategy is to take these parts of southern Russia and turn them against Russia to a point where Russia is uh, literally overstretched to the point that, that even from these places it cannot defend itself. So y you can see the, their strategy ever since the Soviet Union dissolved that every uh, place that was, that used to be uh, part of the Soviet bloc is systematically turned against Russia. Russia is split into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. And that's what you had with the with the stands, that's what you had in Eastern Europe, that's what you now have in Ukraine, that's what you have now in Georgia. 
and there, uh, this whole Arab Spring thing, they had uh, a very old from like the uh, early 80s, uh, what's called uh, a drawer uh, plan by the Pentagon where they had like war game that for years where they would start a domino effect from like Western Africa, they're gonna topple every single uh, regime that is not uh, totally pro-American or even vaguely, uh, even vaguely independent, and they would just start a domino effect that should uh, reach all the way into these uh, parts of the Southern Soviet Union and turn all of this, all, everything from, you know, uh, Morocco all the way to the Chinese border, it will all be one giant Islamic caliphate with the exception of uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia, who would be used then as a uh, staging point for uh, a, a global coalition of uh, led by America to basically repacify these regions and firmly establish the United States as the hegemon of the entire Islamic world, uh, which before the Soviet Union dissolved was much more uh, pro-Soviet than it was pro-American. Um, Iran, uh, Iran knew, especially after they had this, uh, I mean, before the 1979 revolution, Iran was very, 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 fr the regime of Iran was very friendly with Israel. We had jokes like uh, the price of uh, pistachios. You know what that is? Like the little green uh, uh, oh, yeah. nuts? Yeah, the price of pistachios in Israel was very low because uh, all the airplanes that went from Israel to Iran to export uh, weapons and all that stuff. When they come back, they would load up crates of pistachios they bought on the local market. <laughs> so, and after the 1979 revolution, the Iran was basically a, a more moderate, more Shiite version of ISIS. Basically, uh, the fundamental difference between most Americans don't really understand what that means. Uh, the Sunnis uh, are more like the Protestants and the Shiites are more like the Catholics, meaning that Sunnis have a very like uh, decentralized system where you know the Protestant church in, uh, I don't know, Miami can tell the Protestant church of uh, Seattle, uh, they can dictate to them. While in the Shiites they have uh, something similar to the uh, Vatican, where they have the what's which, what's literally called the supreme leader, uh, which is uh, uh, currently Ayatollah Khamenei. Ayatollah is like a cardinal. They have like a group of cardinals, the Ayatollahs, and they elect a supreme leader, and they and they have like a parallel government. You have like a normal, you know, prime minister, president in Iran. They actually have elections and are in a sense democratic, as in they have elected representatives, but the ultimate power, the ultimate decision stays within a, a religious group since the 1979 revolution. Before that, instead of this religious big religious institution, you had the, the Shah, the king, and he was like a, a, the classic American appointed fascist dictator, basically. And so, and Iran, right after the revolution, you remember they started a big war against Iraq, which is uh, a situation that uh, in Israel uh, we call, uh, I wish both sides good luck in the war situation, where you had both the Soviets and the Americans selling massive amounts of weapons to both sides. And then you had this, uh, you heard about Operation Opera? I have not. Well, uh, basically, you know Saddam Hussein, right? Everybody in America knows Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein, isn't he the man that took the towers down with those magic box cutters and stuff? Uh, Saddam Hussein was a CIA operative who impressed the people in, uh, let's call it the shadow government of NATO enough that they turned him into president of Iraq. 
And then he started doing all sorts of crazy shit, like getting to war with the Kurds and getting to war with Israel. And then he basically uh, went uh, ape shit and started to make wars with and with these and these and these and these. So uh, uh, as part of this uh, total uh, unrestricted lunacy, he decided he's going to build a nuclear weapon to destroy Israel. And uh, of course, uh, the successors of uh, the whole Nazi establishment, uh, specifically in West Germany and most importantly in France, one of the most anti-Semitic countries in history, to the surprise of anybody who doesn't know anything about the subject, uh, decided, uh, well, we'll build a nuclear weapon for you to kill all the Jews in Israel. Sure, why not? And yes, German and French scientists really did start building a nuclear uh, facility in a place called Osirak. And then uh, the Israelis uh, went to the Americans and, you know, started whining. This is a crazy man who wants to uh, destroy Israel with a nuclear weapon. And look, he's building a nuclear weapon. And all the mainstream media, oh, you're just paranoid. No, he's not building a nuclear weapon. But look, here, here. Here, he's building a nuclear weapon. No, he's not. He doesn't mean it. He's just saying that uh, for, for, for internal propaganda purposes. And Israel luckily had a great leader named uh, Menachem Begin who said, uh, you know what, fuck it, I'm going to blow this shit up. And they had Operation Opera and they did blow it up with the German and French scientists inside it. Fuck them. Well, uh, right after that, Iran and Iraq started a very long, very brutal war over an insignificant piece of land because, you know, both the Soviets and the Americans wanted to sell weapons. You had crazy Saddam Hussein on one hand in Iraq and you had crazy Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran on the other hand. So why not let them kill each other and make money from it? And that was the story of Iran all the way till the late 80s. They were involved in uh, supporting the CIA in the war in Afghanistan, but that's, uh, you know, shadowy things. Uh, what happened after the 90s, after the Gulf War, where they saw that, yes, America can form a global coalition and, yes, bring this smack on them and this annihilate and totally annihilate their military, that their military is completely worthless. The military of Iran is even weaker than what Saddam Hussein had. Like, during the Iran-Iraq war, they, they came down to a situation where the army would totally run out of ammo, and they would just go into a nearest big city, and just uh, the local uh, preacher, the Islamic preacher, would just call in a bunch of 16-year-olds. Uh, they called them... Uh, hajibis or something like that and they would just put red armbands on their heads and then just have 10,000 of them like uh, bum rush the nearest uh, Iraqi position and the Iraqis look at the, uh, a bunch of 10,000 you know like a, like a zombie horde of screaming teenage boys running at them and make the quick calculation that they have less bullets than, uh, than to shoot all of these so they would retreat yeah so uh, that's the kind of enemy you're dealing with. And basically when Iran saw that, they started to say, uh, well, unlike Saddam, when we, when we start, we should also have a nuclear weapon, but we should, uh, you know, keep it more of a secret instead of held, holding a press conference here, I'm building a nuclear weapon. Look at how nice it is. I'm going to destroy the Jews. Uh, because like all the like all their religious groups, whether they're, you know, Islamic or Christian, they always have an obsession with the Jews, because the Jews would never convert to their whatever it is that they want. I, I promise you, if the Buddhists uh, were uh, close enough to us, they would also have a problem with the Jews. They just didn't uh, have enough Jews in their countries. If they did, they would also have a problem with the Jews. Uh, so during the 90s and early 2000s, they started, you know, uh, putting feelers out, especially in Russia, for nuclear technology. Uh, like I explained, 
it's only a question of time and money. So they put in very little money on a very long time, so as not to, you know, arouse suspicion. And then towards the early 2000s, uh, people started noticing, like, hey, they are buying uh, nuclear technology from former Russian scientists. They are going to various, you know, forgotten corners of the Soviet Union trying to get their hands on equipment and stuff like that. And, you know, uh, certain alarm bells started to ring in Israel because <laughs> it's quite obvious who they're going to nuke once they have the chance. And especially uh, towards the mid uh, 2000s, the, in the middle of the first decade, where you could see that they're not only building, uh, you know, facilities like Boucher, where uh, when you, it's one thing when you can make like a little experimental uh, reactor. I mean, you have in most big universities. In most big universities in almost every country in the world, you have like a mini nuclear reactor. It's like the size of, uh, I don't know, a little bucket. Just for, you know, like research purposes to show students of, uh, something uh, for experiments. But then when you start like a plutonium production facility or a heavy water separation facility, it's very obvious that what you're building would not be used not for science, not for research, not for creating isotopes to treat cancer, and not to create electricity, and not all the other stupid excuses that work on people who have absolutely no idea about uh, engineering and science in general, which <laughs> happens to be the main demographic of you know CNN and Fox News. But once they started building that, it was obvious, yeah, they're making a nuclear program. And uh, for reasons that are too complicated for me to explain properly, the CIA supported them. Because, uh, like I said, if they do uh, make a nuclear test, the CIA will have legitimacy to... The, the US government, the entire UN, would have legitimacy to not just you know bomb one little place, but to physically capture one of the biggest oil reserves in the world. So they just let them play along. And, you know, if half the Jews in Israel get killed by that, the CIA doesn't really have a problem. So they published their infamous uh, report to George Bush, where they concluded over hundreds of pages from whatever intelligence agency that, you know, the Iranians decided they don't want a nuclear weapon. They're just building all the facilities for that. It's like uh, in America, you have like a law that... Uh, uh, ex uh, people who went to jail when they get out, they don't allow to have a gun, right? If they get a felony, that's correct. Yeah, so it's the same thing. Like uh, the police walk into the the house of some uh, uh, somebody who went to jail, and they see on his table like uh, ten bullets lined up, and then uh, an upper receiver and a trigger and a barrel. And he says, I don't have a gun. I have like a lot of parts of guns, a lot of bullets on my table, but I don't have a gun. Right? I, I, I'm being perfectly legal here. This is just, you know, a bunch of unrelated metals. I use this trigger to open up beer cans. It's not, it's not a gun. It's not part of a gun. No, no, you're, you're absolutely mistaken. But again, uh, there are groups who want to believe the lie, so they believe the lie. But, I mean, it's obvious that he doesn't have gun parts uh, on his table because he doesn't have a gun and doesn't want to have a gun. <laughs> right? You know, uh, that whole so thing didn't make sense exactly. And the official story is, oh, yeah, you know, they're just going to build nuclear reactors for energy and that's it. And, you know... That's obviously for anybody that has a brain knows that there's going to be more purposes than just using it for energy. Now, with that said, because I look at if, if one country has nuclear weapons, well, this other country wants to have nuclear weapons. And then why why don't they have the right to have nuclear weapons? Well, then I guess it comes down to are they going to use those weapons? I mean, because then, you know, here's the thing, man. That's when you start getting into some freaky stuff, because 
the nuclear weapons thing, like you said, if somebody has an engineering degree, they have the money and the resources and the time, they can put something like this together. Now, where am I going with this? Well, I don't think that any government is going to use nuclear weapons because they know what could happen if they go after. Well, there might be tactical uh, nukes. I'll hold, give you hold, hold on, hold on. Let, more let me... scary thought. A hell of a lot more scary thought. Uh, let, let any me... idiot who is smart enough to create uh, a working meth lab is just as smart to create a metric ton of sarin gas and just load it into a truck and spray it and spray it from a. Uh, uh, an overpass in the middle of a giant city and kill 150,000 people and it will take months to even figure out how this happened. So uh, uh, don't, don't, be, uh, don't be so scared that you might die in any moment because you can die in any moment. So just stop being afraid of dying at any moment. It's just paranoia that is in, in you. Well, I mean, I'm certainly not paranoid, and I don't think I'm going to die at any moment. That's not where I'm going with that. I, where I'm going with this is I think it would be a lot easier for somebody, that just like a rogue, crazy, um, disgruntled Billion. individual. To, what's that? Uh, a crazy billionaire, because uh, if you talk about nuclear weapons, the source material is, uh, like I said, you need... The, pro the production chain itself, you need uh, 19 different types of factories just to process it. It's not like, uh, you know, just uh, mining uranium out of the ground and stuff it into a centrifuge and wait long enough and you get, uh, you know, weapons-grade uranium. It's a very complex uh, production chain where you need to have very different types of factories working for years to create this uh, uh, several pounds of weapons grade uranium that's why when you know israel sees us they they are setting up this production chain of you know you heard places like fordu and natanz Home, you, you heard these names, they can say here, this is a, a, a very major part of a nuclear weapon production chain that cannot be anything else. This is the facility in Purdue. it's guaranteed that this is part of a nuclear weapon program and not anything else. You should inspect there, you, it cannot be turned into, to pretend the way to be something else. Well, so, wouldn't it be, let me jump in real quick, wouldn't it be a lot... Nobody can make a nuclear bomb in this basement, if that's what you're saying. Wouldn't, no. it be, wouldn't it be a lot easier for, and I appreciate you clarifying that, wouldn't it be a lot easier for some government that has plenty of money, or even just somebody that's very crafty, let's say, that, that has some intelligence and puts together this grand plan to steal some type of maybe, you know, Soviet Union era nuclear stuff, or maybe find a way to get into you know something in another country, get somebody else's nuclear yeah, weapon, steal it, and then use it based on their own um, be the fact that they're pissed off or something pisses them off. I'm just surprised something like that hasn't happened already because w when the Soviet Union collapsed, there was a whole bunch of nuclear stuff that got basically uh, uh, again you you're displaying your uh, indoctrination. The United States Army admits publicly admits that they're five hydrogen bombs that they don't know what happened to them. You have uh, sunken submarines, you have uh, crashed bombers where it just fell into a swamp, and the nuclear weapon is so very... So how am I showing it's ignorance like then if I'm saying that it'd be easy for a country like that to get access to this stuff, or maybe they already have it, so... Uh, the, the short answer is that there is no profit in it. Like, like I said, any idiot who runs a meth lab can create a chemical weapon or a biological weapon and kill hundreds of thousands of people, but what do you gain from it except for a lot of people dead? You don't really gain anything from killing a whole bunch of people. Well, what is it? You know, there's a lot of that crazy is, people out there, though, is what I'm saying. There's some super psychos out there that don't do it for money. So I'm just surprised that something like that, I'm, I'm very thankful it hasn't, very uh, thankful, uh, but I'm just surprised. Let, let's just say that if uh, that even you know the Iranian secret service and Mossad, if they find out that some crazy guy wants to just randomly kill a hundred thousand people, they would cooperate to stop him. Uh, you will it will probably be at least a century before it goes public. But CIA and KGB 
have very often collaborated to stop this uh, this this type of crazy people regardless of all you know uh, ideology difference and religious difference and all that stuff uh, or, uh, people um, who reach the very top usually have uh, you know a certain uh, connection to reality that uh, allows them to uh, put aside their differences to stop uh, totally crazy maniacal uh, homicidal maniacs but like I said, any idiot with a math lab can uh, just uh, you know create a cyanide and or a taboon or a, any number of other things whose recipes are you know publicly available in the library from World War One, and uh, kill people. But you know it uh, it won't give anything. There would be no result for this. So. When you're talking about something like government, they don't do something that won't give them anything. They want something that has, you know, an end game, a result. That's, by the way, one of the reasons that uh, the the fabled uh, attack, the bombing of Iran, never happened. Because even if you do bomb them, they'll just rebuild these facilities, and you haven't gained anything from bombing them, unless you like occupy the place. Yes, you know, Israel could, there was even, uh, you know, rumored that uh, they were, like, on the launch, uh, about to launch an attack, but even if this attack did succeed, it, it would just, you know, they would rebuild this whole thing and the attack would have to be repeated a few years later, unless it's uh, something like, you know, uh, like a desert storm level where you roll in with all the tanks and obviously Israel doesn't have a, the manpower to occupy something like Iran nor would we want to but yeah unless uh, unless you have like a global coalition invading uh, Iran you would not stop, be able to stop their nuclear program in this way for a long time uh, well li like I was uh, the point I started from is the, the Pentagon plan where they just drop everything like dominoes. That's where you had the, the Arab Spring, where they, they created small pockets of instability, like we started with Iraq, and then you had the, the situation in Sinai. I mean, right now, obviously, the American uh, you know TV viewer, but even the informed people, have no idea that right now in Sinai, the Islamic insurgency is making more attacks than all of Afghanistan combined. And Sinai is, uh, <laughs> for those who forgot, it's uh, the, uh, uh, a strip of desert between uh, Israel and uh, Egypt proper. Like, west, uh, southwest of Israel and east of Egypt. It's part of Egypt officially, but most of the country turned into uh, basically an ISIS-style situation. Where like you have areas in Afghanistan where the Taliban is in control on the ground, and just because somebody somewhere in a police station throws the Afghan flag doesn't mean that the Taliban is not ruling it. So you have the same situation in Sinai. You have the uh, same situation in parts of Libya. And what this whole Arab uh, Spring started is they turned like a, a, a little group of you know uh, ten guys sitting in a tent with AK saying we want to take over the country. To a situation where, uh, remember when I said in the, in the previous interview, where if serious civil unrest starts, all the rich people just vanish the yep. next day, and the people who take over the, is the gang. So suddenly these these uh, you know ten people with the AKs in a tent who wanted to you know topple the government and take over the town, suddenly there is nobody to stop them to actually to take over the town, and so they did take over the town. And especially in Syria, you know, these 10 guys with AKs, they just, you know, uh, they're usually like, you know, uh, petty criminals, like drug dealers or loan sharks and something like that. But then once they take over the town, I mean, the people look up to them because they are, for all intents and purposes, controlling the town. So now instead of uh, 10 guys with AKs, they now have 10 guys with AKs who have uh, 200, uh, you know, assistants. And so they just come up with a you know a fancy name like I don't know the 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 global support front, the eagles of the desert, or the tigers of the mountain, 
or the the militia for the unity of the faith or I'm I'm saying real names of uh, resistance groups in Syria, by the way, all all these uh, organizations do exist, and they just come up with a fancy name, and remember, like I said, the CIA they would sell out if uh, some somebody offered them a million dollars to do such and such. So in the case of Syria or in Lebanon, uh, not Lebanon, Libya, uh, right after they took over the town. Some, uh, you know, shady people with, uh, let's call it, American accents show up and uh, instead of offering them a million dollars, they offer them truckloads of uh, weapons, of, you know, uh, uh, anti-aircraft missiles, you know, uh, high-powered uh, rifles, uh, sometimes even tanks, and say, we'll give you all that if you convince all your people to fight against the, you know, the central regime. And they're like, you know what? Okay, <laughs> sure. And that's how you cre you create things like the Free Syrian Army. You create the what you had in Libya. You create in uh, the support for ISIS in Iraq. The the people with American accents showed up in you know uh, rags on their heads and you know the black masks. They didn't say they're American. They said. We will give you all these uh, weapons and all of this money if instead of uh, uh, supporting the Iraqi government, which you don't like anyway, you support this bunch of guys from Syria. And you had like a situation where, you know, the <laughs> like, uh, you know, five pickup trucks roll up into a town of 10,000 people and say, we're here to conquer you. And the, the local, you know, vill village elders, or the, you know, the 10 guys with an AK, whoever it is that runs the town, uh, they got the visit of uh, selling out before the trucks rolled up. So they say, okay, <laughs> you conquered us, congratulations. And uh, even if there was some, uh, you know, Iraqi army or Syrian army in this vicinity, you still have, uh, you know, the whole town just declare that uh, you are their enemy and uh, like, like I said in every Iraqi family there is an AK store stashed somewhere in the house so when you're uh, you know 10 guys in the checkpoint isolated where you're you know 50 miles away from any reinforcements yes you're gonna just uh, grab your stuff and run and that's how you know uh, 500 guys in pickup trucks managed to make uh, two Iraqi armored divisions to just run away because if they stayed they would be surrounded in enemy territory with no reinforcements so of course they ran away it's not like they were you know especially you know cowardly or something no they ran away because they they really were not in a position to win but uh, let's get back to Iran so these dominoes started falling it started in Tunisia then you went to Egypt, then Libya between them, and, uh, they just started falling, 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 then they went to Syria. In Syria, they could not collapse the local, uh, uh, the local rich people didn't run away fast enough. That's basically the problem that they ran into. And once the, the initial wave, of, you know, the momentum was slightly lost. Then you had uh, Russia to a small degree, but especially Iran, basically throw everything they have at them to stop this movement because they knew that the next place to fall would be Iran. You had the, uh, uh, what you call it, a false start, the student revolution, the green revolution. You remember when they were, right when Obama came into power and they, you, you had students protesting against uh, rigged elections in, in Iran and, they, and then the police just uh, machine gunned them in the streets locked uh, thousands of them in ah, people are gonna accuse me of uh, making uh, you know Zionist propaganda though. you can check out you know in 2009 videos of you know people standing in the street and then suddenly sniper fire shooting like you know teenage girls and stuff so uh, yeah, and that's where they managed to like contain it in Syria. Then when when it failed to you know to Syria to fully uh, you know uh, collapse, they just they started you know how about we create a situation where we skip Syria and go uh, into Iraq, and that's how I followed the the rise of ISIS from the very 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 beginning because 
I instantly uh, understood that how it would be done. Because, uh, I mean, uh, anyone who is, uh, how do I put it, trained by an advanced military, anyone who is, you know, either a veteran or even had good uh, basic training, I mean, training in a good army where, you know, they actually know what they're doing. Uh, you can watch videos of, you know, the Syrian army or the rebels fighting and it's just, it's freaking funny. They, they do shit like uh, uh, a tank rolls into a narrow street and then he, the, the street is not wide enough for him to turn. <laughs> so he like goes to his commander on the radio and asks the commander from, because the commander is a cowardly piece of shit. So he's standing uh, a mile away. So from a mile away, the binoculars is like going, uh, left, uh, right, left, right to guide the tanks to to back out of the of the danger area, or they or where they have these uh, you know ridiculous infantry attacks where they don't understand even the the concept of uh, of uh, flanking or maneuvering or cover fire or you know things that any teenager who played the uh, battlefield on the internet does understand the Syrian army does not. So basically, uh, what the CIA did is he br is they brought you know the ace of aces, the the Superman elite of the entire jihadi army. That's the Chechens, people who have like serious experience about fighting uh, you know fighting the Russian army, fighting you know attack helicopters and tanks. They know how as infantry they can resist an attack by uh, a vastly superior force that has tanks and helicopters when they don't. So when they brought out these 200 guys and set them up in like a little village in the middle of the desert in Syria, I saw, oh yeah, oh yeah, they're gonna, they're gonna just take over half the country. And uh, these guys really did, they laid low for a while, then they had the, 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 local, the Syrian army just try and attack on them. And they, this, this bunch of 200 guys counterattacked the Syrian army so hard, they captured like 10 towns and a giant air force base and just swooped them off the field. And when these, uh, you know, uh, the 10 guys with an AK, with AKs, like I said, who suddenly run the, the, the nearby town said, whoa, these guys really know their shit. We should join them. And then you had one town joined, and another town joined, and another town joined, and another town joined, and it just it's, it just swept like a wave. And like I said, when when the town didn't want to join on their own, they had the the visit of people who offered them money to join, and they just swept like a wave from from central Syria all the way into Iraq, and it's basically they reached uh, basically the the outskirts of Baghdad. That's how powerful this this motion was. Where in suddenly you had a situation when uh, how old was he? Twenty six year old uh, Abu Amar al Shishani, uh, Tarhan Batrashvili was his real name, I think. A twenty six year old became the uh, general commander of a of an entire country. I mean, the Abu Bakr al Baghdadi is like the political figure, and he ran the army. A 26-year-old guy, who was his base, his previous background, he was like a, a sergeant in Georgia who like spent time in jail for gun smuggling, and he suddenly becomes basically the the most powerful man of a country of his own. That's how this situation was created. So all of this, uh, you know this whole ISIS thing of, of their great power, it's just uh, a, con uh, a giant, like, uh, a union of little gangs. But because they had these 200 people who were joined by former high-ranking officers from Saddam army, who, while incompetent, still on a certain level know their stuff, this suddenly turned into this big giant ISIS that uh, you're told in the media that cannot be destroyed. But the point I was saying with Iran is that Iran wants to have these nuclear weapons to make sure that uh, this uh, domino does not reach them. 
because they they tell their people that it's to attack Israel, and I'm sure that if they had a nuke, they would attack Israel because they are crazy religious fundamentalists who, uh, you know, it's like uh, in America you have these little groups that say, uh, you know, uh, uh, tomorrow morning Jesus will come and we will all go to heaven with him. So you have the same thing with Islam that, you know, we're going to blow up Israel and suddenly we'll all go to heaven. Well, yeah, <laughs> they will go to heaven on a nuclear fire. But, uh, well, is now, I don't know because I've never been to Iran, but I actually know somebody that grew up out there and his dad was a part of the Iran special forces or something. And now the guy owns a car dealership in the Northwest. You know, I mean, I'm, but to make a long story it? short, he, I don't really... No, I asked him a little bit about what it was like out there, but there's I hear mixed things about Iran, but there's a lot of just normal folk out there too, right? I mean, there's a lot of people yeah, out sure. there that are just everyday nice people. They they have good yeah. intentions, and they're not plan. Their plan is not to hurt anybody. Oh, their personal plan is not to hurt anybody. I'm sure you didn't have a plan of uh, you know starting the Boko Haram movement in Nigeria that kills millions of people, but your government sure did have that plan. So it doesn't matter what you personally wanted. It matters what your government did. And the Iranian government does have, did have, still does and still will uh, do things like the Buenos Aires bombing, where they decided that it was in the national interest of Iran to blow up a synagogue in Argentina. Why? Because they're crazy religious fundamentalists. Why did they, you know, created the giant Hezbollah? Why do they support Hamas, who is not even Shiite, but Sunni? And they throw billions of dollars of them at them with weapons and stuff. Why? Because that is what their government is. Because like I said, they have a, a prime minister and a president who are elected, but above them you have the supreme leader and his bunch of ayatollahs, and they call the actual shots. Because it, it's not, uh, like I said, this is a, a country, it's like if Italy was run by the Pope. They wouldn't. They like would have a, you know a president, a prime minister, a parliament minister, but the, the the guy controlling the army would be the pope, and the pope would you know fight the enemies of Catholicism. And that's the situation you had in the Middle Ages, where you know the the pope would send giant armies, or the pope would decide that let's kill all the Jews in Spain because I feel like it, and that's where you had the Spanish Inquisition. Or uh, all of these, uh, you hear about sometimes, you know, uh, all the Jews got deported from some country. That usually was an idea of the Pope. Like, uh, the king got into some, I don't know, trouble with the Pope. You know, our, our relations would be a hell of a lot better if you just forced all the Jews to leave. It's like, okay. <laughs> it's much cheaper than uh, keep, uh, staying in a fight with the Pope. So, uh... uh uh, as I was, yes, uh, the normal people, the everyday people are not necessarily in Iran specifically because Iran is like a, a very ancient culture. Iran is actually the Muslim country with the biggest number of Jews. <laughs> After, you know, Israel was established and basically the entire Muslim world turned uh, extremely anti-Semitic. <laughs> as you would call it, the only countries that uh, actually had like a sizable Jewish community left are Iran and Turkey. Because unlike the Arabs who are, you know, don't really have uh, a deeper culture, the Persians are, you know, uh, however a thousand years old. They're, they've been there since the beginning. And uh, in Turkey you have the, they have basically a similar situation. Where because it's a very ancient civilization, they can, you know, tolerate people who are different from them because they are uh, uh, culturally deeper than just hating somebody because he's different. <laughs> in in the Iranian parliament, there is actually the they have like by law that one of the members of the parliament is always a Jew. And they like they force him to show up in the, into every single parliament session, you know, in case Mossad gets some original idea. <laughs> so uh, 
But uh, yes, Iran is uh, is involved with terrorism, is actively trying to kill Jews, is actively supporting Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, to a certain level the Palestinian Authority, is uh, financing anti-Semitic stuff, is financing groups that are, uh, you know, uh, opposing Israel on the media, in, in political context, all that stuff. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, Iran it, Iran does want a nuclear weapon to have it as a deterrent. And their uh, strategic aim, I mean, they know about the American, you know, domino plan to reach the, the southern part of the Soviet Union. And, you know, America never did they consolidate Afghanistan and Pakistan enough under their control that they could use it as a base of operations to push further north. So they, when, when the Afghanistan thing failed, that was uh, the, the long-term strategic idea behind this whole invasion of Afghanistan, where the United States wanted to basically use that and neighboring Pakistan as a, as a bridgehead to control all the former Southern Soviet Union. And when that failed, they started working on the domino plan to push it from all the way from Libya through Egypt through Syria through Iraq and through Iran and Iran knows that it's in the middle and they hope that if they have a, enough of a military deterrence to stop any sort of action like this they would be able to you know like Syria get skipped over and the America would find some excuse to directly invade these countries and uh, they even start like you know establishing like uh, a quasi little Taliban groups in in like I said when when your when your country is ruled by a crazy dictator who thinks he's the new Jesus or the new Muhammad, uh, it's very easy to you know find uh, and uh, find an alternative, find people who want to kick him out, or when you have this uh, Nazarbayev who is controlling the country since before the Soviet Union collapsed. So yeah, they're you know funneling these. Yeah, it's a very long-term plan of establishing these uh, little enclaves. Uh, you know, it starts ten guys with AKs uh, in a book club, thinking about uh, overthrowing the government, and then one of these ten guys gets uh, you know starts getting money envelopes from uh, certain clandestine organizations. And then uh, it starts from 10 to 50, and then they establish a network, and then they have communications, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, uh, like in Libya and Syria, suddenly you have street protests, the rich people leave, and these 10 guys in the little book club become the rulers of the town. Then you have another town, another town, another town, and the entire country falls. Uh, so, in a nutshell, uh, to, to sum it up, basically, uh, Israel would probably not attack uh, Iran without the without the uh, a ground element composed of an international coalition. When the, Iran is, you know, obviously violating the treaty that they had, they had like a like a fake treaty where we'll give you a lot of money. If you just uh, you know stop doing shit like developing missiles that reach not just Israel but their the missile test that you heard about it was this week I think it was it, these are uh, cruise missiles like accurate cruise missiles that reach not just Israel they will reach Europe and they're working with the North Koreans to build a nuclear capable ballistic missile that will reach to the United States. So, <laughs> the question: Why are you? Why do you need missiles that reach the United States? The Iranians, you know, smile and wave. But uh, uh, it's hard to say what will happen in the future because, like I said, the the long term plan that's you know decades uh, in the making of, uh, you know, eventually taking over the southern part of the Soviet Union. It's still in play. The question, how would they modify it to the circumstances that are now formed in Syria, where the rebels have uh, basically lost and the country will be uh, restabilized, is hard to tell, but 
if you're asking me if Iran has a nuclear weapon, like I said, they have all the pieces to make a nuclear weapon. They just haven't, uh, you know, they they haven't yet uh, put them together in a missile silo. But they do. They if they have the order uh, within uh, you know a week, they will have a, a a missile, a nuclear missile aimed at Israel that is you know uh, on the launch on the launch pad. They could have it within a week. They just haven't uh, you know started uh, assembling it. I wouldn't be surprised though if they had maybe some old Soviet era technology or some type of nuclear tech that they purchased from another country. But I do know that I worked with somebody, this was maybe, okay, 13, 14 years ago that back in the 80s worked on satellite technology with the U.S. Navy that could actually track nuclear weapons because of the, um, the actual plutonium yes. and the, uh, the actual components that put nuclear weapons and together. No, no detectors, yeah, I know about that. So I guess it would be easier for these factions to be able to keep track of where everything's going so they know who's got what and if it's going to be you know, not, released or not, something like that. Not necessarily. Uh, there are ways to... Like I said at the beginning, there are elements, especially under Bush and Obama, the ruling, uh, uh, let's call it the ruling elite of groups like the CIA and even in Mossad, uh, were people who preferred for strategic reasons to ignore this whole uh, Iranian nuclear effort because it would be more profitable for them in the long run if Iran really was nuclear because then they would have a legitimate reason to attack them and occupy them and make the money from all the oil that they have. So they, they sort of, they want to get attacked. It's like... Um, hmm. When you have uh, like two people from uh, who have like extensive uh, background in hand-to-hand -hand combat, when they fight, they basically uh, once you you know uh, throw uh, an uppercut punch with your right arm, he was uh, the your opponent was trained in like fifty different ways what to do in ex in this exact situation to make you lose, because. Once you know that your arm is in this and is in exactly this position, he knows fifty different ways to defeat you from this position. So the the way they fight is they like uh, uh, try to throw a fake punch and then uh, try to you know attack them from another way because that's the the only way to like breach the defense. But basically, the guy who starts the attack first exposes his position. That's why he loses. So the the strategic aim was that they want to Iran to do something like a, an underground nuclear test like they had the North Korea do or like announce uh, yes we have a nuclear weapon or uh, do some sort of uh, I don't know or have like a, a nuclear accident where one of these things like leaks radiation from a, a weapons grade uh, uranium or something so they want Iran to get to a point where they make the mistake of uh, exposing themselves and become vulnerable to attack. And Iran knows that uh, people are waiting for them to expose themselves. That's why they just stay secret and, you know, smile and wave. It's uh, the smile attack, as uh, Netanyahu calls it. So, yes, they have, they have weapons. On what level these weapons they have, uh, nobody really knows. I don't think even they know because it will be like separating 50 different places. But if they wanted to create an attack within a week, they could. That's uh, basically the assessment since 2010. And like, like I said, a nuclear weapon is time equals money. We don't know how powerful that weapon would be. It could be something as primitive as the, you know, Hiroshima Nagasaki bombs. Because the, when the North Koreans, uh, you heard about their several nuclear tests, and Many of the, them fail. The uh, it's not exactly a failure. It's more of a they did not reach even the like I said. It has a lot of calculations. A lot of very. It's not only calculations. It's practical tests. It's uh, it's too complicated to explain. But they they have to 
uh, every single uh, part of the bomb will have to be tested and retested to make sure that it matches exactly the calculations. And so the Koreans simply didn't have the time and money to make all the tests as accurately as they needed to be. And that's why the weapon worked, but not to the extent that it was supposed to. I mean, it still does blow up as a nuclear weapon, it's just not even as powerful as the Hiroshima bomb. Just because they didn't invest enough time and money to make it as good as the Hiroshima bomb. Which is uh, laughably ridiculous, but, uh, you know, it's still a nuclear weapon. It will still uh, create, you know, a shockwave and kill tens of thousands of people and uh, uh, cause radiation poisoning and all that stuff. So, it, it, it for it for effect, it is a nuclear weapon. How viable it is is a different issue, but it's still a, a viable nuclear weapon. It will probably have the same thing with Iran. And uh, speaking of like Iran, we, if I can jump in real quick, the Stuxnet virus that was uh, that shut created down the by nuclear- American intelligence and given to Israel by. Uh, factions within uh, the American community who don't want to see a nuclear weapon explode in the Middle East. Yes, that's Stuxnet. Now, do you remember that file name that was, some people think, in reference to a possible Bible quote from a flower in the Middle East called Miritus, I think? Uh... Uh, how, how, how would I answer it? I can neither confirm nor deny that Israel was a very active uh, participant in creating and developing the Stuxnet weapon. <laughs> Does that answer your question? That's fair enough. I appreciate that. And also, I'm thinking about how I've heard that since then, I was doing just a little bit of research even, there's been other countries that have been hit, hit with this virus, or it's been modified, actually, and used against Western factions now. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it is this whole uh, area of cyber weapons, if you're not, uh, you know, very well educated in computers, you don't... Uh, uh, basically, uh, a powerful cyber weapon is, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, if, if you look at a nuclear weapon not as uh, something that uh, kills uh, people, but something that causes, uh, you know, uh, economic damage, military damage, industrial damage, then cyber weapons are just as powerful as nuclear weapons. Uh, I can probably not say almost anything about that subject that's even though I know because this is information that was never revealed to the public and if I'm the first to do that I would go to jail but let's just say that the the capabilities of cyber weapons are above and beyond you know just uh, shutting down the power this there are cyber weapons that will kill people thousands of people millions of people at the push of a button, it, they are just as, uh, in terms of the damage they can do, they are just as, if not more powerful than uh, even hydrogen bombs. And s- countries that do hold them have like, uh, you know, cyber command that is more uh, important than nuclear command because in cyber command it's like you can, it you can do the equivalent of blowing up. Uh, a hydrogen bomb in, I don't know, Los Angeles and kill 5 million people, but nobody would ever be able to prove who did this. And that's the the scary shit about cyber weapons. They are uh, powerful enough to shut down entire armies. They are powerful enough to uh, completely disable uh, all command uh, and control system. They can uh, disable not just power, they can actively sabotage hospitals, banks, uh, factories, uh, water supply, uh, you name it, anything that has a computer is potentially vulnerable to the attack of a cyber weapon. And 
this is basically the new nuclear weapon and uh, obviously countries that uh, do not have the capability of making a serious nuclear weapon they do invest in uh, in cyber weapons and a lot of countries have it because it's uh, again a question of time and money except this time instead of uh, physicists and chemists to create a nuclear weapon you need uh, uh, computer experts and computer experts are much <laughs> Are ironically much easier to train and easier to find and uh, countries that have uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know very open to technology like Israel or uh, South Korea or China uh, modernly or various European countries do have cyber weapons that have uh, the potential to make as much damage as a nuclear weapon uh, so uh, every time you hear about you know Russian hackers, Chinese hackers, that's like that wouldn't even cover one one thousandth of their capabilities. And the Stuxnet virus, in his uh, you know in his overall uh, effect, it it was it could have been a hell of a lot worse. I mean, instead of uh, what they basically did is to make the equipment less efficient, make it, uh, you know, uh, wear out faster and produce less than what it was supposed to. But on the other hand, they could have programmed this system to, you know, make uh, a, a nuclear accident that would be 50 times worse than Fukushima and turn all of Iran into a, in an irradiated wasteland. They could have done that if they wanted to, but they didn't. That was not the objective. But the potential to do something like that does exist. Uh, <laughs> next topic before I, I say something that uh, gets me into serious trouble. Well, I almost want to ask you to keep going, but I certainly do not want you to get in trouble. So let's move on to the next. <laughs> let's move on to the next topic. That's the curious cat in me there going. Oh man, nine lives, nine lives. So Sudan and not Sudan, but Syria, I remember several years ago, Assad, Bashar Assad, I saw images of him floating around on the net that he got shot and he was dead. His body was bloated. You could see the, um, the bullet wound, but I'm thinking to myself, this could be easily fabricated, but I haven't heard much at all about him since then. And, you know, Syria, many places in Syria is in complete ruins, like Damascus, I think, is in extremely bad shape. Or maybe it's the, maybe it's Aleppo out there. I'm not sure it's one of those two cities. Maybe it's they're, both. They're all, in they're all uh, very much destroyed, except for the areas where they didn't have protests, like uh, Latakia, which is basically the home turf of Assad. No, Assad is alive and well. Uh, he's doing TV interviews uh, basically once a week, just they don't reach the American media for obvious reasons because you know they don't want you to to they don't want your viewpoint to contain information about Bashar Assad but uh, where are you going with this so is that faction out there in Syria are they a lot like um, the Iranian faction as far as religious beliefs at the top level what's Syria all about because you know me being an ignorant American I don't know I just hear what the media is portraying and the information that I've been able to obtain, just little bits and pieces of a puzzle. It's like, uh, how do I explain? Uh, the this, the, the Al-Assad, uh, uh, Al-Assad is basically like the godfather of, of a vast mafia, which is the ruling elite of the Alawite sect of, Shi of Shia. They have like, uh, it's uh, in a way similar to Catholicism where they have like saints and uh, stuff where you don't pray to, you don't pray directly to God, you pray to, I don't know, uh, Saint Peter or Saint Bartholomew or whatever you do down there. And uh, that's why the Sunnis really hate them because this goes very deeply against the Quran, uh, who, I mean the Sunni version where you know it's very pure and uh, you know there is no other god but god so they had a lot of attention in, in that area uh, the story of Syria is in general the the Shiites 
the Alawites that basically took over the country after a CIA staged coup in the 50s. Then they had another coup, then they had another coup, then they had another coup. And basically the, the country became so unstable that the Soviet Union took it over through the Al-Assad family. So basically his father was a president, now he is the president. Uh, as far as his, as his personal character, there is a, one personal story that I can give from my time in the army because that was uh, right around when the, the revolution started. It's an event, you, you can easily check it on, uh, on Google right now. Uh, when the big protest started and uh, Assad saw that his country is about to get dragged into a civil war similar to Libya, he wanted to make a big distraction by starting a fight with Israel. So he had uh, several hundred civilians uh, bunched up on the uh, heavily defended, heavily mined uh, border between Israel and Syria and the Golan Heights. And he basically rounded up several hundred people and told them to run towards the Israeli border with, you know, uh, machine guns aimed at their backs. And he told them to run for the minefield. Luckily for them, Israel has... Uh, periodically demined the minefield that was there and basically you had a very confused situation where hundreds of unarmed civilians who are clearly hostile uh, are running towards uh, the border of, an, of a very unfriendly nation and uh, I could say something very compromising on, on, on our current army chief of staff but I would not do this at this time but basically due to uh, interesting circumstances uh, the Israeli chain of command was so confused that they just uh, decided you know what <laughs> fuck it let's just move out of their way I mean what the hell are they gonna do so you had Assad personally give the order I mean it, it could not have been done without his direct permission to force hundreds of civilians towards uh, the Israeli border where he planned that they would get shot and instead of, you know, protests against Assad, it would be protests against Israel who shot hundreds of unarmed civilians and the, you know, the average person would not be smart enough to think what the fuck were hundreds of civilians doing uh, near the border of a hostile country trying to break through. <laughs> So basically the Israeli army just led them through and they reached the, the nearest uh, Druze village. Uh, who are, I mean, the, let's call them Muslim, the, the first Muslim village. And they said, uh, guys, go back home. We don't need you here. <laughs> and that's how this stuff ended. And even more funny, a few weeks later when that failed, he tried again. And this time the Israeli army deployed an entire battalion of special forces snipers and something like 400 people got shot in the leg. And that's how their second shot stopped. Oh, by the way, just uh, to show you how different uh, your, uh, uh, how infused your mindset is, remember the movie American Sniper? Oh, yeah. Remember that they had a scene where they, he has like a, a, a kid throw a, trying to throw a grenade at um, an American tank and then he shoots him and then his mother picks up the grenade and it shoots her too. Uh, you can watch it, your viewers can watch it and uh, know this for themselves just how uh, horrible that was. Uh, anyway, we were talking about Syria. Uh, so, like I said, the plan was to just bring the place down and uh, I wanted to talk about the Al Safira incident in detail we'll probably have to do it some other time uh, but uh, basically the plan was that Syria has uh, you know a giant stockpile of Syria is one of the most heavily armed uh, countries just on the planet I mean, their army overall is small and laughably incompetent but they do have a whole lot of guns and the plan was that they create a situation where the uh, things in Syria get so bad that so many bad people get control in so, of so many bad weapons that they would have, uh, have to have an international coalition push in. Uh, in terms of... Uh, sorry. You probably heard a lot about uh, the Kurds in Kurdistan. 
and in terms of uh, again my personal Israeli perspective, uh, the Kurds are one of the few people in in the Middle East and in the Islamic world especially who are not uh, you know anti-Semitic, and uh, we we Israel helped them a lot. I mean, ever since they didn't get a state because the French and the British decided they don't get one because it was not comfortable enough for them. Uh, Israel, ever since it was founded, was sending uh, you know military advisors to the Kurds, and a lot of uh, the Kurds actually do kind of like us. And we send not only military advisors that stopped uh, you know from Saddam uh, killing all of them like he tried, and uh, even governments before him. And so, uh, and yeah, we we also send uh, we focused a lot about because. Uh, a society is not just uh, as powerful as its military, it's actually the values. So that's why you have Kurdistan is like even more than, you know, the official uh, republic with a constitution like uh, Turkey, it's na the, the neighboring Turkey that occupies them. Kurdistan has things like, you know, women's rights and the religious freedom. And it's basically one of the few places in the Islamic world where in the center of the town, you can uh, walk into you know a bar and drink beer in the streets, even though Islam says you can't drink alcohol. So that's that's uh, to a large degree uh, uh, a very big uh, long-term investment that Israel did. So the reason Israel was sold on uh, uh, giving its uh, you know tacit approval for kicking off uh, a mess the size of the Syrian civil war, the Americans convinced them that if you do that you would be, uh, th there is a good chance that an independent Kurdistan would form, which would be uh, democratic, uh, free, and very likely actually an ally of Israel. And uh, there is a, it was published by some big newspaper that they revealed that uh, <laughs> the biggest contribution to the battle against ISIS in terms of raw, uh, you know, money was actually made not by America, not by Russia, not even by Iran. It was made by Israel, who facilitated the Kurds from, uh, you know, exporting their oil through special smuggling routes into Israel, who processed it and basically financed the main uh, military opposition to ISIS, which was the Kurdish Peshmerga. So <laughs> Israel did more than America, Russia, and Iran combined in terms of uh, sheer money to fight ISIS. So uh, uh, that was uh, the, yeah, you have the Kurds who are trying to, for, you know, for decades, trying to find, uh, to create a government of their own. Uh, I doubt that they will ever succeed. They are they are too uncomfortable for their neighbors to be allowed to be successful. And also, the Americans started betraying them in the last uh, year or so. So now they just, uh, uh, especially the, uh, yeah, e even uh, now under Trump, you can see moves that they are uh, basically uh, uh, trying to reintegrate. Uh, the already de facto independent areas of Syria and Iraq that were, you know, Kurdish back into their governments with promises like, you know, autonomy and, you know, religious freedom and all that shit. But uh, we all know how that will end, right? You know how, how you can trust the government to leave you alone for many years because they said so. Yeah, they always have your best interests at heart. They love but, uh, us. They love you. They're our best friends. Yeah, and the, so the Iraqi government and the Syrian government love the Kurds. They love them. They would never, you know, uh, kill 5,000 of them with uh, airborne uh, chemical weapons like they did in Halabja, right? They love them. They, 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 are, they are all Muslim, you know, they're all... Uh, they're all Muslim, they're all part of the great Iraqi nation, the part of the great Syrian people, right? <laughs> no, so, um, basically, once the Kurds became the, the whole process of the revolution, you had a lot of street protests, then 
the government uh, had uh, like agent provocateurs put there by by Western intelligence agency that uh, you know you had like a police lieutenant that you see like uh, it's like a situation where you had uh, to to put in the in American perspective where you had these uh, you know riots even had one yesterday I think in some university right so yeah. if uh, if you have like a police lieutenant who is controlling the local SWAT team and says he, you know he gives the order just uh, gun down everybody on the street and uh, you have like uh, one policeman who is also uh, an agent start shooting and then the rest start shooting because one of them always starts shooting and then you have like you know 50 100 uh, dead uh, protesters so you had that in several places in Syria and the Kurds who saw that the government become was weak because like like I repeat all the rich people suddenly leave they just you know they already have a, a political system, a structure. Like I said, they have all these, you know, local councils and women's rights and local rights and like a, a, a tradition of, you know, playing by the rules. That's uh, the, the key. People in America don't don't really appreciate how important it is where you can force uh, people uh, who are powerful that even though they're powerful, they have to stick to certain rules. In, in in a lot of uh, you know even in like places like uh, Eastern Europe you don't have that I mean you you're rich you can just you know shoot people in the street and nobody will care which incidentally happened yesterday in Ukraine they had like a bunch of uh, government prosecutors getting drunk in a bar and suddenly one of them just pulls out a pistol and starts shooting <laughs> and the police show up and try to arrest him and he's like, I'm the state prosecutor, and the police just let him go. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that in America this would not happen. But maybe I'm wrong. Uh, anyway, so they had this uh, cascade of protests. And like I said, the, the local gangs suddenly just took over entire neighborhoods. And uh, Assad really quickly found himself in a situation where you have like entire uh, town, uh, entire cities with a million people, like. Aleppo and Hama and Homs and uh, and Idlib, who are just uh, there is no government uh, presence anymore there because once the entire um, uh, because when a city of a million people turned uh, so you know you have this you know so soldier somewhere somewhere in his base and you know his dad calls him you know. Uh, me and me and mom decided that we we are no longer loyal to the government. Listen, son, just grab your gun, or even don't grab your gun. Just come home. Stop listening to this uh, president and his uh, stupid government. And that's what happened. People just entire entire divisions just uh, switch sides, like in a day, or sometimes even just the uh, you know the the commanding general just. Uh, people with uh, Western, with American accents, showed up and gave him a suitcase with, uh, you know, ten million dollars, and said, "You're now part of the Free Syrian Army." And he said, "Okay, if you can give me another suitcase next year, I'll still be a part of the Free Syrian Army." And that's how they formed this, you know, uh, resistance to Assad. Over time, obviously, people who fight for ten million dollars or for a crate of guns, they they tend to melt away. Because they don't have the the staying power to fight for years, for years, and uh, basically the winner of this sort of situation is the most uh, you know organized, the the most the people who believe the most in their ideas, and the the only idea on the market is obviously not democracy. <laughs> Nobody in Syria is gonna want democracy or you know human rights or you know separation of powers. No. They fight either for money or for radical Islam, and as the uh, money, you know, the the supply begins to reduce, uh, radical Islam is all we have left. So you have all these organization of, like I said, a start from ten guys with uh, with AKs in a book club, who suddenly took over the town. Over time, they would they would either uh, either fall, either the organization will fall apart from you know internal conflicts or running out of money or whatever. Or they join uh, an Islamic organization like uh, the Al Nusra Front or ISIS or Akhwal Sham or any of these. 
and all these uh, organizations would all would also they are they more often fight among each other over who is more Muslim than they fought the Syrian army, but they would inevitably also either collapse like they had in Khaleb in Aleppo, or they would join ISIS. They, they have no you know alternative. They they would they could not be a moderate force once it collapsed in uh, in Libya because of the NATO intervention the central government collapsed fast enough that these uh, factions did not start open warfare until after Gaddafi was uh, you know removed from power and killed but right now Lib Libya has uh, basically the same scenario as in Syria you have one government in Benghazi you have another government in Tripoli you have uh, various uh, neighborhoods in certain places that are ruled by ISIS. You have another group that rules the deserts. You have um, military, like private military companies that control oil fields. You have this village with his militia fighting against that village and his militia and, you know, a total chaos. Uh, the same thing in Syria. In Syria, the, the difference is that the, the previous central government did survive. They are holding in certain places, and uh, eventually they had, you know, the the muscle to win back some of these, you know, million million people cities like uh, Hama and Homs through very long sieges, and now they control Aleppo, the, basically the only place that uh, the so-called moderate rebels still hold is uh, Idlib on the Turkish border. And Dara in the south, in the in the Jordanian border, but uh, yes, within you know six months to a year, if the Syrian government wants to destroy them, they will destroy them, and then all you have left is ISIS. And uh, it's my personal prediction that ISIS would be allowed to exist. Personally, in general, I uh, call me evil, uh, and you know very evil and Machiavellian, but I support ISIS because I want all the Islamic world to see that their stupid Islamic fundamentalist uh, Ummah, uh, you know, Dawa al Islamiya, uh, this whole concept of Islamic State ruled by Islamic laws is a stupid idea that will fail. Just like, uh, you know, the Soviet Union with all its communists, um, it, it should have been shown that it's a stupid idea that I would fail. Uh, and I, I personally, no, you call me heartless, but I have no mercy for the people who will die to make this idea fail. But I want them to see that it fails from the inside because it's a bad idea, and not because you know uh, the the Russians and the Americans showed up to destroy it. And uh, it seems to me that uh, you know various uh, outer forces uh, agree with my idea because. This whole thing about ISIS being a military power, uh, it's so ridiculous, uh, I, I cannot convey enough to you. I mean, uh, every, uh, let's call it a seriously armed country, uh, and I include like places like uh, France, Britain, even you know, Sweden or Italy, has something that's called uh, Air Mobile Armored Brigade. Which basically means they can, they can just the president uh, gives the order and at the at the push of a button within you know, uh, seventy two hours, uh, an entire armored brigade would deploy in the field in, basically, a thousand miles from any border of any friendly country, uh, America and uh, Russia and, uh, yeah. In a questionable matter, even Israel, they could just, you know, just push a button, and 72 hours later, you would have 1,000 combat-ready tanks in the middle of uh, Syria if they wanted to. And especially, you know, Russia and America that have friendly bases; they could just deploy this armored brigade, and it would just sweep all before them. <laughs> if they just, you know, this, uh, you know, resistance around Mosul, ah. These are still, you know, these guys with AKs, or they just, uh, you know, force a 14-year-old to just, he here's a gun, here's a thousand bullets, shoot them towards the enemy who are coming from over there. It's not the kind of force that can resist the attack of a well-organized armored brigade. They would just sweep them aside and take over in like three or four weeks. But neither Russia nor America are interested in doing this. 
Russia, the whole involvement in the Syrian civil war is about money. They don't want the war to win. They don't want to win the war. They don't want the war to end. This whole, uh, I even hear uh, from, you know, Russian opposition how much the money this war costs. They don't get that for every tank that gets burned in Syria. They get contracts to sell tanks because, you know, you can show here, this is a tank that works on the battlefield, works perfectly. And it's cheaper than the, you know, the American Abrams. The T-90 is cheaper and, you know, it's better in a lot of ways. So for every tank that the Russians uh, lose uh, or every uh, guided bomb that they drop in Syria, they can sell 10 of these to, uh, I don't know, uh, Peru or India or Algeria. So uh, the longer they are in this war, the, the more the Russian military industrial complex has a chance to develop. Remember I was talking about how... Uh, uh, the Russian military industrial complex never was uh, even remotely restored to what was in the Soviet Union. The oh, yeah, Sy absolutely. The, the Syrian war is enabling, uh, the longer it goes, the more powerful the Russian military industrial complex is able to become because they have a steady source of both income and, uh, you know, uh, contracts. Because the Syrian civil war, as tanks get destroyed, they have to get the, you know, uh, spare engines, spare uh, oil filters for the tanks, uh, bombs for their airplanes. And so it gives the, the Russian military industrial complex uh, a long time, uh, an opportunity to really develop, to grow back in, uh, in capacity. Because it's not just, you know, hiring, you can't just, you know, hire an extra thousand workers and within a week you will triple your production. No, you need to you need to order machines, you need to hire engineers, you need to give the engineers like months to work on, you know, in, uh, figuring out ways to in, uh, speed up production and you need to like invent new equipment that will only go into use like 10 years from now. Because, you know, military development, especially today, is very, very slow. It takes decades from going from the drawing board to something that's actually not, not just a prototype, but something that's actually in the hands of the military. I mean, the general, not the, you know, special forces. So, yeah, the, the Syrian civil war, the Russians wanted to continue. And the Americans uh, also, uh, you know, <laughs> obviously those tow missiles and, uh, you know, all the advanced weaponry, uh, all the, you know, uh, Soviet-style uh, tanks that uh, the rebels have magically seized from uh, the Syrian army in, in numbers four times bigger than the Syrian army ever had, ever. Obviously, they come from the CIA, and obviously there is a, what you call it, a consulting fees, you know, mediation fees. Somebody is making billions upon billions of dollars from uh, the U.S. Uh, clandestine budget. So, yeah, there's a lot of elements in America who want uh, the war to continue. That's why uh, it's very uh, strange where I heard the news that uh, Trump uh, gave the order to, like, come up with a plan within 30 days how to destroy ISIS. I was actually going to just ask you about that, about that executive order that passed where they're going to supposedly put together a plan that, yeah, they want to eliminate ISIS. So that was that was interesting. Well, uh, as I said, the, the you have the uh, right now there are boots on the ground, as you call it in America, at least 10,000 American soldiers. If you just. Uh, go to the, you don't even need the, you know, Saudi Arabia, you just go over to Iraq and ask them to, you know, lend their uh, Abrams tanks to these 10,000 American soldiers. They could take uh, Mosul and Raqqa and every single village, uh, just, you know, uh, it's going to be like a Black Hawk Down, you obviously did watch, right? You remember where, where yes. they just they they roll in in a long line of Humvees and just shoot with machine guns at anything that moves through the streets. Yes, they'll just, they'll just take two hundred tanks, do the exact same thing in every village ruled by ISIS. They would take over the territory in three or four weeks, and maybe Donald Trump doesn't know that, but I promise you that all the generals know that. 
and the fact that they didn't answer him right away, sure, we could do that. We could just, you know, send in the tanks and sweep all before us, <laughs> shoot anything that moves. And uh, obviously they don't tell Trump, so uh, we'll see how that pans out. But like I said, uh, you know, a war starts uh, because somebody can make more money from uh, winning it, because somebody thinks you will make money from winning it. And this war continues because people are making a lot of money from the fact that it continues. And, you know, the Syrian people is, uh, you know, fuck them. <laughs> Nobody cares. The, the, only, the only thing people who care are people who told them to, you know, refugees welcome. And uh, even these are getting shut down rapidly, like in Europe. So, uh, yeah, that's basically the, uh, the, the Syrian civil war, again, you can have, like, uh, the American, uh, what's it called, the uh, 1st Armored Division in Fort Hood, it's like, uh, I don't know, 30,000 combat troops on fast deployment. You could just deploy them in Iraq on one side, and the Russians can deploy an equally powerful force on the, the west side, and you could just fight until they meet in the middle. And ISIS would be destroyed as a, you know, as a solid uh, country. ISIS would be destroyed in a month or two. But they are not doing that because they do not want to. Because it's more profitable to let the war go on. Uh, in terms of the terrorist attacks, that's uh, uh, I'll cover it if I probably in the next show when we talk about the surveillance state because, you know. <laughs> for uh, you know, for decades, uh, the Europeans, especially the stupid French, yelled about Israel. Oh, you're so evil! You have soldiers in the streets, in the you know, uh, across the 67 lines, and you have surveillance state, and you have checkpoints. You have uh, uh, racially discriminating police, and you have like uh, secret agent and informant networks in Arab villages. And now they had two, just two serious, uh, ah, okay, fine, four serious terrorist attacks. And the, the big France who wanted to rename themselves as freedom and they have all this, you know, since the French revolutions, they're the liberté humanité. Now they also have soldiers in the streets, networks of informants, surveillance, they had all the, the whole nine yards and they dropped to it within what, two years? One year. Their France is legally, officially under martial law ever since the, the big uh, Bataclan attack. They are under martial law, tanks in the streets, uh, total surveillance states, informant networks. It, it just, uh, you know, they don't really notice it. But yeah, <laughs> you know, the New World Order has taken over. Just because, you know, uh, people who are outside the Muslim communities don't see anybody get shot on the street, so they just don't care. They don't care. So, <laughs> yeah, this big, uh, you know, uh, scenario that people have about, you know, totalitarian government taking over and, you know, arresting all the people who think differently and they oppose the government, that's going on right now in France, in Belgium, in Holland, uh, to an extent, they started that in Switzerland and Austria. So, uh, yeah, welcome to the New World Order. You haven't noticed, but it's already here. Now, a lot of people speculate that what happened in Bataclan was actually um, an event that was orchestrated with specific clandestine agencies oh, in yeah, order yeah. to cause yeah, that, a reaction, problem, reaction, solution. Yeah, yeah, obviously, obviously it was orchestrated, I can just, off the top of my head, name like 15 stuff, uh, especially when they had this, uh, you remember they had the hostage situation where a terrorist just walked into a Jewish supermarket and took hostages? That was so totally fake, it, 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 it just, uh, I, my jaw dropped when I see like, a, Maybe when you show this, uh, you know, in, on uh, on YouTube, you could just put it as a background, the video of them breaching the store. When you have like 20 cops uh, get up to the garage, it's like a garage door, and they just, they all stand there and wait for the door to come up to the end. 
and they know that the guy has a bomb and a suicide vest and an AK and they all stand right at the front of the store. So if the terrorist actually actually was a terrorist who wanted to kill the police, who just, you know, throw the bomb at the, you know, bunch of cops who are standing right at the door waiting for it to get all the way up. But he obviously didn't. No, nope. he wasn't there to kill cops. He was there to kill a bunch of Jews and create a big headline in the media that would legitimize the French government to spy on everybody in total violations of not just, you know, their recent constitution of the rights that they had since uh, the French Revolution in, uh, you know, in the 18th century. We have to, you know, change our way of life because one dude uh, decided he hates uh, Jews and kills them. Of course he wasn't sent by the police, you know, he just, he had a giant bag of dynamite and he, went, and he could have killed 20, 30 special up SWAT police units. But no, he decided to just, you know, stand there and take the bullets. Oh, I, I really loved it. Uh, I could probably find, if I look hard enough for the uh, eyewitness testimony from people inside the supermarket, I really love it how, you know, after the door gets up and these, you know, 30 policemen, special forces are aiming guns at him, the guy runs towards them, 30 people are shooting at him, and he made it to within arm's reach. A guy with a suicide bomb vest made it within arm's reach of these police so that the media would be able to see him from the outside. That's, that's like beyond super fake. They, they wanted him to run outside so that the cameras could show that he was killed by the police to avoid questions, uncomfortable questions. Because... If you try to run while 50 bullets hit you, the, the thing that is guaranteed to happen when the third bullet hits you is that you're going to get stopped in place. It's like, ba like basic Newtonian physics. When uh, several bullets hit you, you get thrown back, not forward. You definitely don't reach within arm's length of the people shooting at you. But no, they wanted him to go outside to where the cameras would see him die. They, they needed that. They needed that. Especially after the, the big, uh, uh, the big uh, fuck up of the, uh, the Boston bombing, where they, they had a video capturing the terrorist that was declared dead on the scene. They, they showed the gurney pulling him out. And they even had, uh, I think, Alex Jones interview his uh, mother or his aunt or something. I'd say, no, the guy evacuated in the ambulance, that's my son. He was alive. And they're lying that he's dead. They're lying. <laughs> so after that fuck up, no, they needed the cameras to show him die on the street. So they just let him, let him towards all these cops. It was totally staged. It was horribly staged. About the Pulse nightclub, uh, don't even get me started. Uh, most of these shootings... It always comes out they were, on a, they were on a watch list, there were FBI agents in contact with them, it was all known. Uh, and then you have like uh, crazy stuff like the Aurora shooter, his dad is part of the uh, psychological warfare program. It's, 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 why, why, why? No, no, they needed a mass shooting, they needed another mass shooting. It, it's a plan because when you have mass shooting, when people are afraid, like when you said, when you're afraid that some guy in a basement would build a nuclear weapon, then uh, maybe the government should install radiation detectors in all the basements for our safety. Because they love you. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I like where you're going with that. Definitely making a lot of sense. And... You know, we've been going now for over three and a half hours. I could certainly go another three and a half hours if, if you, you know, had that much um, left to, to go that long. But we could definitely um, talk a little bit more if there's something you feel is important and discuss more here next well, time you want to come well, back on the show and we'll get into the surveillance state and stuff too. Uh, maybe we should just, uh, I mean, I'm going to get accused again in the comments that I don't talk about, you know, this whole uh, the Palestinian issue, the the whole Khazarian issue, the whole uh, you know origins of the Jews, origins of the Illuminati uh, 
Freemason stuff. So uh, I think uh, that should uh, definitely be on our next conversation. And uh, what was on my list of topics? Oh, I wanted to explain uh, how uh, how uh, a hypothetical war between uh, the U.S. and uh, you know uh, China or Russia or Iran would uh, play out and how fast uh, what would be its results because uh, people who have not experienced uh, a war game do not understand just how accurately it predicts what will happen if uh, you know conditions are the same as the war game says and uh, I maybe r really talk a little about the whole uh, ancient aliens thing because I I have some things to say about this uh, from uh, you know uh, not just a, a scientific skeptic point, but in terms of uh, you know, like I said, there are there are mathematically proven things that you know would would happen, and this process will uh, take place in this and this order because it is mathematically the most efficient uh, path. So uh, and maybe just uh, you know go into some uh, little. Uh, caveats like, uh, I don't know, talk about a little about uh, this whole uh, question about the, the moon where people say on one hand the lightning was a fake and others say that there's just like uh, a base in the moon where 10 million Nazis secretly live underground or, uh, you know, bases on Mars and all that stuff. Uh, I, will, I will on one hand debunk most of this, on the other use my engineering program to explain what would be, uh, you know, what kind of resources and technology would be needed if that is indeed true. And, uh, and uh, what else? Uh, the, you have my list of topics, that's, uh, you know, things I, I'm sure I know, I have uh, hours of things to say about that. But uh, the rest, uh, uh, you know, eh. you, you should really be start uh, to more aggressively question me about stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I'll tell you, I, though, I for hours. you know, here's the thing that I've noticed in this conversation that we've had is I was more aggressive in this conversation and you did hit on some really key topics that I think is important. And with the time that we had, I feel that even though it was a long conversation. We got double the amount of information in this amount of time than we would maybe with uh, another platform for this type of question and answers. So I think this was great, man. This was definitely a another fantastic round of information. And we can close this out tonight. We'll definitely do it again soon. When you'd like to come back on the show, I'll be more than happy to have you back on. I'll work around your schedule. And um, this is just much appreciated. So I thank you again for sharing this information with us and being very balanced and and giving us a perspective from somebody that lives on the other side of the world or at least here in America, somebody that lives on the other side of the world, I think that's pretty cool. Talking about Palestinians, I would be uh, an extreme right winger fundamentalist in, by uh, American hands, American eyes. I would be an extreme right wing fundamentalist and I'm gonna generate a mountain of controversy. <laughs> So you want to talk about that next time, then? <laughs> oh, oh yeah, you're, you're going to hear some uh, seriously political incorrectness uh, on my part. Okay. Well, you know, I mean, I'll give you an open platform, absolutely. Just please keep things respectful. As, and, um, you know, that's one thing that I encourage everybody to do, even if you have differences with somebody. If you can go at it in a respectful manner instead of just going out and calling somebody names and telling them they're the, the Antichrist, yeah. you'll probably have a better I, I chance not, of working I, something I would out. not stoop to that level. I, I don't think you will. I don't think you will. I, I'm just, you know, kind of saying, throwing that out there. But, um, Alexander, man, you're, you're uh, uh, greatly appreciated. You're very knowledgeable and uh, one of the few people that I can talk to for three hours or longer and be just totally mentally stimulated the entire time. I mean, you had me going, you had me thinking, and a lot of what you're saying definitely resonates. So as far as the technologies and the possibilities and the engineering standpoint and stuff, so I appreciate that. So because uh, people who are uh, of my of background similar to my own, they just, uh, they're either camera shy or they just don't think they're good enough or they just, uh, I don't know, don't get the, uh, the audience or the platform to just talk about these things but uh, 
uh, hopefully it will inspire others, better others to, you know, uh, follow my lead and overpass me. Ah, well, uh, I'm hopeful about that. Right on.